Now, turning to another well-known argument that claims to justify the belief in a God, let us consider the so-called argument from design. This argument goes as follows. Observe the perfect order in the universe. Observe the clock-like regularity of the motion of the planets. Observe the progression of the seasons. Observe how conveniently man is made. He requires oxygen for his survival, and he has lungs. Surely there has to exist a master designer who arranged and planned all this. How else can such an order be explained? Well, let us analyze what it means to state that the universe has order. Observe that this is merely declaring, if one thinks about it, that A is A, though such is scarcely the mystic's intention. What alternative to an ordered universe would a mystic envision? Everything that exists is something, after all. It is what it is, and it can only do that which it can do. An acorn is an acorn, and under appropriate conditions will always grow into an oak. An oak, however, will never shrink back into an acorn. Is this the mysterious regularity that the mystic needs God to explain? The laws of identity and causality make it fully intelligible. We don't need reference to a supernatural entity. The alternative to an ordered universe would be a chaotic universe, meaning a universe where oaks did shrink back into acorns and then into college professors and then into cloud formations. A chaotic universe is a universe without identity or causality. Such a universe is impossible except to the mind of a mystic who has never grasped that A is A and who looks with wonder on the fact that winter always comes after fall and before spring rather than sometimes coming after spring and before summer. As for the argument about how wonderfully and conveniently man is made, it is only necessary to observe that he wouldn't be here if he weren't. There were species, after all, whose bodily structure was not so convenient and who consequently died out. Would a mystic explain them as a slip-up on God's part? Obviously, the only species we are familiar with are those whose structure is such as to permit them to survive. Those whose structure is not such are not here for us to study. Still a third argument, closely related to the argument from design, is the argument from life. According to this argument, the proof of God's existence is said to be found in the fact of the existence of life. In mathematical terms, claim the mystics, the possibility that life could have arisen by accident, by chance, is so inconceivably remote as to be virtually impossible. Therefore, the mystics conclude life must have arisen by design, therefore God. This argument rests on offering man two alternatives, both of which are equally irrational and untenable. The two alternatives being that either life came into being by chance or by design. In the metaphysical sense, there is no such thing as chance. In a universe of identity and causality, there are no literal accidents. Chance is a concept pertaining not to reality, but to human knowledge, and in a manner of speaking, to a state of ignorance. Men say that an event happens by chance only because they do not know why, in fact, the event did happen. To give a simple illustration, if I throw a coin in the air, we may say that it is only a matter of chance whether it lands heads or tails. But actually, there are very strict scientific laws that will determine on which side the coin does land, depending upon a number of factors, such as the angle which it is thrown, the velocity, etc., etc. It's not a matter of chance, strictly speaking. It's only chance from the point of view of human knowledge. Another sense in which men sometimes speak of chance as that we say two men met by chance, meaning an event that took place not by someone's conscious intention. But that really is irrelevant to the concept of chance as discussed here. 
What I want to repeat is that in the metaphysical sense, chance is really a senseless concept. To realize, however, that neither life nor anything else happens by chance is not to conclude that things happen by design. Here again, mystics reveal their failure to understand the laws of identity and causality. That which happens in the universe happens by necessity, by the intrinsic natures of the entities involved. Whether life is some primary element that has always existed, or whether it arose out of a combination of other elements in a manner yet unknown, is a question really quite irrelevant to our purpose here. What is relevant is our understanding that the concept of chance has no metaphysical validity whatever, and that the rational alternative is a recognition of the full meaning and implications of the law of identity, not the positing of some mystical supernatural designer. Now, the attempt to explain events in the universe by means of a god is very, very old. It doubtless goes back far, far into prehistory. Many years ago, while still in college, Leonard Peikoff wrote a rather interesting paper on this subject, from which I would like to quote. Quote, In what manner was the concept of the divine first formed? Its first appearance was in primitive societies and civilizations. The first form of the concept of the divine was polytheism. Primitive man, living thousands of years before modern science, could not explain why the Nile overflowed at the same time each year. He accepted as an explanation that there was a god of the Nile who directed and controlled its activities. He could not explain why lightning occurred when it did. He accepted the existence of a god of lightning as an explanation. He could not understand why he sometimes won his battles and sometimes lost them. There was, he concluded, a god of war who controls and determines the outcome of battles. Firmly entrenched in the methodology of the primitive man was the following premise. If one does not understand the cause of an event, if one cannot account for it, Attribute the cause to a being who controls this kind of phenomenon and call such a being the god of this phenomenon. By this process, the earth was soon populated with hundreds of separate gods, and the population grew as each separate country began to establish its own particular gods. There were Egyptian gods of war, Hebrew gods of war, Babylonian gods of war, and so on, for lightning, vegetation, the sun, the moon the oceans, etc., etc. Although these gods were anthropomorphically conceived in that they had material bodies, could be good and evil, and were finite, they nevertheless were thought to surpass man in two respects. They had more knowledge than man, and they had more power than he. Man did not know about lightning, but the god of lightning did know. Man could not make the Nile overflow, but the god of the Nile had that power. And so developed two characteristics which were to remain associated with the concept of God until the present day. Gods have knowledge of and power over the aspects of nature which are theirs. It is perhaps unnecessary to comment at this point upon the invalidity of the methodology of the primitive man. My only reason for doing so is that many people today believe in a god of life for the same reasons. They believe that, since man cannot yet account for the process by which life was born on earth, it is necessary to explain life to believe in a god who created it. But this methodology, whether employed by primitive man or by moderns, is irrational. When one asks for the explanation of an event, one asks, what is the cause and how does it produce the effect in question? 